What's up guys, welcome back to the second video in the hybrid training series. If you missed the first video, we introduced the series, discussed what we are gonna go over in the series, and gave a brief introduction of hybrid training and how it differs from other training methods. That way we're all starting from the same baseline. As a quick recap, in this series, you're gonna be able to follow along with my workouts and we're gonna go over exactly how I build hybrid programs as a coach. And the goal is by the end of the series, you'll be able to create your own hybrid program for your own goals. That said, in this video, we're gonna cover the underlying physiology that you need to know in order to make your own hybrid program. If you hear that and you think, oh my goodness, I do not want to watch this video, do not worry, this is not gonna be a super in-depth video. I'm gonna keep it fairly high level. That way you walk away with exactly what you need to know without feeling like you're sitting through a college class. All that said, I'm gonna to go to the gym. I've got an upper body day today as I'm peaking for my powerlifting meet that's coming up fairly soon. And then we'll come back to the home gym, pull out the whiteboard and get into the video just like we did in the last one. All right. Um at the gym, it is uh, raining. I wanna mention this is the first time I'm bringing my actual camera into the gym, so I don't get gym anxiety anymore. I haven't in a long time, but I am anxious to bring this in because uh, you know I'm gonna be that guy with an actual camera. I wasn't gonna do it, but I'm gonna do it because I have a lot of clients and a lot of people that uh, reach out to me that have bad gym anxiety, and it's just something you have to get over, something you have to go uh, put yourself in uncomfortable situations to get over. And so that's what I'm gonna do here. So if I can bring this camera in and film myself in a warehouse gym with people that are a lot stronger than me, um, then you can go in and just work out regularly in a gym where you feel the same way. So today is an upper body day. I have paused bench, dumbbell bench, dumbbell row, weighted chin-ups, and rolling tricep extensions. I did not bring my belt for weighted chin-ups, so hopefully they have one. With that said, let's go in. workout's done. Um, I did get through everything, so that's good. I'm happy with my bench. Um, the pause bench uh, set of three that I did coming into the meet, so that's good. One thing I forgot to mention before I came in, you might be wondering why I have a gym membership when I have a home gym. I just got the gym membership a few weeks ago, and I thought I would uh, tell you guys why. Really, uh, two or three reasons. You can call them two. I'm going to call them three. First, I ran out of dumbbells. I've got 90 pounds of dumbbells at the home gym, which is not enough now for my dumbbell bench and my uh, row, which you might've seen in there, I wasn't using over 90 pounds for dumbbell bench. It's because my shoulder, I was happy with my um, paused bench and my shoulder started to feel a little bit. So I decided to go a little lighter on the dumbbell bench, but it was cheaper to get the gym membership than it was to get new dumbbells and new plates, which I'm gonna tell you about right now. Um, 
I ran out of room on my bar to do deadlifts because I have thick bumper plates and I could have jerry-rigged with my bands and stuff and made it heavier but it was again cheaper to get the gym membership than it was to get new plates and new dumbbells so um, really though I've, I've run out of dumbbells a long time ago I just ran out of room on deadlifts which brings me into the third reason which was kind of the catalyst for the other two which is I've got the power to meet coming up so I wanted to use the equipment that I'm going to use at the meet. So Texas deadlift bars, Texas squat bars, kilogram plates. I don't have kilos at home. I've never used kilos until I got the home gym or until I got the gym membership here. Yeah, uh, the, the kilos, the equipment, the atmosphere. I've been lifting more than I was at the home gym. Not to say I couldn't have lifted this much at the home gym. Again, it could just be that I'm peaking. So all my training's coming together. That's probably what it is, honestly. Very happy with today's workout. So I'm going to go home and eat, shower, refuel, and then we'll get into the energy systems and the underlying physiology around hybrid training and creating hybrid programs. Again, don't be worried. I'm not going to go too in depth. This is not going to be a you know crash course physiology. This is just going to be a higher level overview of what you need to know to build hybrid programs for yourself and what I take into account when I build hybrid programs for my athletes. Again, this is all building. So the last video described hybrid training. This video is going to be the underlying physiology and energy systems. And then we're going to get into the programming of hybrid training. Yeah, without further ado, I'll see you guys back in the home gym. All right, what's up, guys? We are in the home gym now with the whiteboard. I said I was going to have this hung up. I don't have it hung up yet. The lighting looks good here. This worked last time, so we're still here. And you can see we've still got the cardboard to keep this engaging. I wanted to mention, even though this is a hybrid series, if you don't want to train hybrid, if you're just focused on performance in one sport or you want to train concurrently, this episode is still going to be beneficial for you. And the future episodes will be beneficial as well. While the series is geared towards hybrid training, performance training, concurrent training, a lot of the same principles apply. They're just applied a little bit differently. And so you're still gonna get value from this. Like I mentioned before, this video is very focused on practical application. And so we're not gonna get too in the weeds. This first part is gonna be the probably most science-y part that you feel like, just to give some background information. And then we're gonna get more into practical application. So the most important thing physiologically is understanding the energy systems when you're programming hybrid and you need to know about ATP to do that. So we are gonna discuss ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's a molecule in the body and you'll normally just see ATP. You normally won't see it spelled out like this, but I wanted to spell it out so you know exactly what we're talking about. So ATP is important because it is the energy currency of the body. And so when you need any energy, ATP has to be broken down for that. So I've, I've written here, energy created by the breakdown of ATP. One of the examples I like to use is gas in a car. Gas is the energy currency of a car, of a non-diesel car and a non-hybrid car. Now we have electric cars and everything, but gas is the energy currency of a car. So you need gas and you need oxygen to go into a car. And then that gas and oxygen is lit on fire, you know, combusted by the spark plugs and you get various gases, heat and energy as a byproduct. So that gas is lit on fire, various other gases come out of that and it gets very hot and then the energy actually pushes the piston, which drives the car. In a similar way, ATP is the energy currency of the body. Like a car can't run on anything but gas, your body basically can't run on anything but ATP, at least as far as we're concerned for this. So ATP is one adenine and three phosphate molecules, known as ATP. Your body breaks this down, just like gas is lit on fire in a car, your body breaks this down in a process known as hydrolysis, and you get ADP, energy, and a phosphate. So basically that phosphate is broken off and that results in energy. So everything you do from walking around, running, lifting uses ATP and ATP then needs to be replenished for your body to do any more activities. And that's what we're really gonna get into today is how that ATP is replenished because without ATP, we can't do anything that we normally do on a day-to-day -day basis. We can't work out. We really wouldn't be able to do anything. If you're familiar with um, when somebody dies, they get what's called rigor mortis where they lock up this is because they're no longer able to make any more ATP and it completely runs out and their muscles lock up and they can't move anymore. We're not really gonna get into like the mechanics of that as far as the muscle cell, but just know that you need ATP to do anything. And when ATP is used, it needs to be replenished somehow. That way we can continue to do our activities. Hey, real quick, I wanted to mention that this series is designed to bring you from not knowing how to program for hybrid training to writing your own programs. That way you can go off and crush your goals. That said, this is a lot of information to work through and it's gonna take some time for you to learn what you need to know to build your programs. Not to say it's not possible and that is exactly what this series is designed for, but it will take a little bit of time. In the meantime, if you wanna get started on something that's gonna get you moving towards your hybrid goals, 
while you work on learning everything you need to know to create your own programs and go off on your own, I have something that's just for you. I've created a team on Train Heroic that you can join. The programming comes out weekly and it's focused on increasing speed, power, strength, hypertrophy, and endurance. So it develops all the qualities that are gonna be great for a good base for you to then go off and start your own hybrid program. If you're interested, the first seven days are free, so you can get started absolutely free, no strings attached, and then it's $49 a month after that with absolutely no commitment. You also have the ability to contact me directly through the app and I'll respond within 24 hours to you to answer any of your questions. So you can get started right now, join the team for a month or so, and then cancel any time as soon as you're ready to start following your own program that you've made throughout the series. I just wanted to jump in and give you guys that offer because I truly want to help you guys get to your goals as fast as possible. And I want you to have something in the meantime while you're learning how to build your own programs. With that said, let's get back to the video. All right, now we're going to get into how is ATP replenished. This is going to be probably the most important part of this video. So if you've got something to take notes, I would do that or you can come back and watch it later. But having a good understanding of this is going to be important for our future videos when we start talking about programming because we're going to start talking about how our training is impacting these different energy systems. So there's three big energy systems and we're gonna go over those right now. You may already be familiar with this and if you are, I encourage you to stick around. You might still find something helpful. And if not, you can skip to the next chapter where we start talking about some of the other adaptations that we're seeking to drive. First, we have our phosphagen system. You might also see this as ATP-PC in different texts or articles. This system gives us immediate energy for activities that are 10 seconds or less. The primary energy source here is ATP and creatine phosphate that's stored in your muscles. So it's right there, readily available, and it is the fastest way to produce more ATP. Some example activities where this is the primary energy system is sprinting, heavy lifting, power exercises, things that last short amounts of time and require higher amounts of power or force. The phosphagen system needs about three to five minutes to recover and completely replenish the ATP and creatine phosphate in the muscles for you to then given all out again. This is why if you have been part of a power or speed program, you might see a lot of very short duration activities like 40 yard sprints, 30 yard sprints, sled sprints, Olympic lifts with long, re longer rest periods. And it might've confused you at first because you might've been like, I'm not doing that much volume. So why is my rest period so long? This is one of the explanations for that. And there's no oxygen required since you're just using local ATP and creatine phosphate. The second energy system is the glycolytic system, and this powers medium duration activities up to about two minutes. This replenishes ATP by breaking down glucose to produce more ATP, and it does so without oxygen. So you see there's no oxygen required. The activities that this is the primary energy system are really anything that lasts up to that two minute mark, but aren't shorter than 10 seconds. Some examples would be 400 to 800 meter sprints or lifting circuits that have little rests so you don't get any recovery period between lifts. There is a byproduct of the system and it is lactate and there's some metabolites and things that are also byproducts. You might be familiar with the term lactic acid. We'll discuss that in a second after we get through this, but just know that the glycolytic system has lactate as a byproduct. And finally, we have the oxidative system. So this powers prolonged activities for two minutes or longer, things like distance running, cycling, swimming, anything that's longer than that two minute mark. This system uses oxygen, so it doesn't need oxygen, to break down glucose and fats to produce more ATP. And as I said, it does require oxygen. This energy system can produce a lot of ATP, but it is slower than the glycolytic or the phosphagen system. And so this is why it doesn't really become the primary energy source until two minutes plus. But this is why you can go for a long time once you've built up that endurance. You can really just go and go and go and go, and you're still gonna have the ATP as long as you're eating and fueling your body so that you have glucose and fats to be broken down to make more ATP. It's important to note that all these energy systems are used all the time, and these specifics are just which energy system is the primary energy system for the activity that you're doing. This is a little graph that you see in a lot of physiology texts and stuff about energy systems. So you've basically got on the y-axis the percentage of energy that's being used, and the x-axis is time. So you can see red would be the phosphagen system, so it shoots up very quickly to provide you energy, and then very quickly drops back off. The glycolytic system kind of slowly comes up, and then when the phosphagen system has been depleted, the glycolytic system comes up and takes over for about two minutes. And then that starts to taper off and the aerobic system is coming up slowly the entire time until it becomes the primary energy system. But all of these systems are always active at all times, always using ATP, replenishing ATP. It's just which one is the primary energy source for the activity that you're doing. I wanna take a minute to discuss lactic acid. As we said, lactate was a byproduct of the glycolytic system. And a lot of you are probably familiar with the term lactic acid. 
A lot of us were taught that lactic acid is the reason our muscles start to burn and our performance starts to decline. Long story short, lactate is not really an acid. Lactate is actually used in the cell for energy and when it accumulates to a higher amount than the cell can use, it goes out into your body to be used by other organs. What's actually happening is that as lactate increases, so do all of these byproducts like hydrogen ions. And if you remember from maybe high school, you have a certain pH, which is basically the acidity of anything, and your cells in your body have a certain pH that they like to operate at. Hydrogen ions are positively charged, so they offset that pH, and it does become more acidic. And as such, you start to get kind of a burn, and your performance starts to decline because your body cannot operate in that acidic environment, and your body's always trying to get back to a state of homeostasis or a state of, you know, staying the same. And so that is why we measure blood lactate to measure things like this. And that's why lactate threshold is a thing if you're an endurance athlete and you've heard that before, because these metabolites and ions increase pretty much at the same rate as lactate. And so by measuring lactate, we can also measure the amount of ions and metabolites that are building up. That said, I wouldn't recommend going around and correcting all of your friends. Hey, lactic acid isn't really a thing. Most people are not gonna care and are probably gonna look at you a little weird, like why do you know that and why do you care? But it is a delineation to make for us because we're talking about building programs and we're gonna use the right terminology throughout this series. All right, so now that we have a good idea of where our ATP is gonna come from based on the energy systems, we now have to go over what specific training adaptations we're looking for. This is gonna become important because with every workout, you're asking yourself two questions. One, which energy system is the primary energy system? And that's gonna give you context around the whole week. Am I training this energy system enough? Is this energy system fully recovered from the last session? Things like that. And two, what is the training adaptation that I'm seeking from this workout specifically? And how is that gonna look as we progress week to week? And when am I gonna change that? How is that gonna play into the overall picture of the adaptations from the program, from the training block we're in, so on and so forth. Before we get into this, one thing I haven't talked about so far is muscle structure. We're not gonna get super in depth to this, but basically your muscles are made up of muscle fibers and those muscle fibers are controlled by nerves that run from your brain to your spinal cord and then to the muscles. The amount of muscle fibers that a specific nerve controls really depends on the muscles. For a larger muscle, one nerve is gonna control a lot more muscle fibers and for a smaller, more fine detailed muscle like your eye or your fingers where you're able to make small adjustments, there's gonna be less muscle fibers per muscle nerve. That entire thing, the neuron in your brain, the nerve that runs through your spinal cord and then to your muscle, that's considered a motor unit. So when we talk about motor units, that's that whole chain. That's basically the extent of what you need to know from muscle structure. You can get very detailed, but we don't need to do that. If you're interested, there's plenty of YouTube videos, plenty of books on the topic. So first we're gonna talk about the adaptations we want from strength training. So from strength training, the adaptations that make us stronger are increased muscle fiber size. So that's gonna result in an increased muscle size in general, right, that you see but the muscle fibers are actually what's increasing in size, better coordination and activation of those muscle fibers. So when you do a lift, not all muscle fibers are activated and some of them get fatigued and then more muscle fibers get activated. And so as you train, you activate these muscle fibers in a more coordinated, better manner for the activity that you're doing. And then also increased efficiency in the nerve signal transmission of the muscles. So that's that motor unit that I was talking about. These last two are what account for a lot of the newbie gains because the first few weeks of training, if you haven't strength trained before, you notice you don't actually gain a lot of muscle mass, but you do get a lot stronger. That's mostly neurological and mostly these last two. So when we're looking at a strength training adaptation of, hey, I wanna get stronger, these are the adaptations that we're seeking to make. Obviously, if you're an endurance athlete, you might want a little less size. So there's a lot to consider there, which we'll talk about a little bit here and in future videos. From an endurance perspective, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a more efficient heart. So a more efficient heart means you're increasing the stroke volume. Stroke volume is basically how much blood your heart pumps for every heartbeat. So as you become more trained due to various factors, your heart actually outputs more blood per heartbeat. And this is one of the reasons why a highly trained endurance athlete will have a lower resting heart rate because your heart is more efficient and pumping more blood. So it has to pump less to get the same amount of blood throughout your body. And secondly, increased cardiac output. Cardiac output is a measure of how much blood is passing through your body in, I believe it's a minute. And, you know, an increased stroke volume will increase cardiac output, but there's multiple other things that also increase cardiac output. And so those are the two large heart adaptations from endurance training. We're also gonna get more efficient ATP production that relates back to the energy systems we just talked about. Those, those energy systems are gonna become more efficient at their jobs. And as such, we're gonna become more efficient at our endurance activities. 
And then lastly, also relating to the energy systems, we're looking at increased clearance of lactate, hydrogen ions, other metabolites, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can better clear that lactate and those metabolites, then we can move faster for the same effort level. Again, we'll get into that more as we start talking about the more in-depth stuff when it comes to programming endurance training, but those are the large overview adaptations we're looking for with endurance training. These are a little counterproductive because with strength training, your muscle increases, your muscle size increases, and that is actually less efficient. And with endurance training, you're seeking maximum efficiency, and that's really hybrid training. How do we find the middle ground there? And that's what we're gonna talk about throughout the series, really. And lastly, we're looking at work capacity. If you're a tactical population, or you run obstacle course races, Spartan races, things like that, work capacity is gonna become something that's very important to you, so we're looking at those adaptations as well. General work capacity is going to explain your work capacity kind of systemically over your whole body. So in order to increase our systemic general work capacity, we're looking at seeking greater endurance, more efficient oxygen utilization, and overall systemic improvements in metabolism and fatigue resistance. So this is gonna be kind of a combination of endurance and strength training that's gonna to lead to this. And again, we'll talk about this more in depth in future videos. And then we have specific work capacity. So this is gonna be activity specific, specific to the musculature that you're working. So it's gonna be some of this general stuff, but specific to that musculature. And then it's also gonna include just improved efficiency at the movement you're doing. A good example of specific work capacity is say you're very efficient at high rep lunges. That does not mean you're gonna be very good at high rep pushups per se. Even though your general work capacity might be really good, your specific work capacity for push-ups might not be trained, whereas the specific work capacity for, say, high rep lunges has been trained. Now that we work through all that, you know what ATP is, you know what energy systems are used to replace ATP, and you know the specific adaptations we're looking for from a strength, endurance, and work capacity perspective. Now in future videos, we're gonna work on putting all that knowledge together to understand how to create a hybrid program for your goals. And again, this is gonna work whether you are training for hybrid goals or whether you wanna train in more of a concurrent manner where you're doing strength training to enhance a endurance sport or vice versa. So if you don't identify a strictly hybrid, that's fine, you're still gonna get benefit from this series. But if you are working on creating a hybrid program, having this background knowledge is gonna be very important for the future videos. With that said, if you found this helpful, I would appreciate it if you liked the video to let me know that you liked it. And if you subscribe and hit that notification bell, you're gonna get notified of future videos as soon as they come out. And if you got any questions or concerns, leave them in the comments below the video. I read every single comment and either like or reply to every comment that is constructive or helpful or ask a question and not just a comment that's derogatory. That said, I will see you guys in the next video on our hybrid training series.